Good morning, everybody. Please and thank you. Very important. Um, a special morning for us here. Uh, I, I don't know exactly, you know, if you understand what it's like for a pastor or a preacher, but it's always exciting when you start uh, a new series. And uh, we just finished a very brief series on the basics of the Christian life that we called Roots. And now we're going to talk about, um, for the next, oh, 20, 21 weeks, we're going to do a message really focused on what it means to be in God's kingdom. We're going to do a very careful verse-by-verse study through the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's an important time uh, for our culture, for our, ourselves, for us as a congregation, really to give some very close examination to these words of Jesus. So I'm going to pray uh, to start us off. I'm very excited about what God gives us to do in these next 20, 21 weeks, and let's, uh, let's prepare our hearts right now. Father in heaven, we are so grateful. We're grateful, God, uh, for your word. We're grateful for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We're grateful, Lord, for the many ways that you bless us. But Lord, we feel a great need to constantly be brought back to a focus on your word and on the importance of your kingdom. So give us this heart, give us this vision. Lord, I pray that not only uh, for this particular Sunday, uh, Lord, but for the next 20, 21 weeks, as a pastor Nate and I teach through this series on the Sermon on the Mount, that your blessing would be upon it. And that, Lord, it would not only be in the preparation and in the presentation of the message, but your blessing would be on the hearts and the minds of your people as they receive it. So do that in our midst, Lord, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Please open your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew chapter five. This morning is sort of an introductory study to the whole idea and the great themes of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, for this introductory study, we're really just gonna be focusing on the first two verses of Matthew chapter five. The Sermon on the Mount comprises three chapters in the Bible, Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. And as I said this morning, we're gonna take a look at the first two verses. So if you would, just take a look right now with me at verse one and see what it says. It says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. If you ever have the chance to go to Israel, or especially if the chance to go with us on one of our tours, Pastor Nate just mentioned that next February and March we'll be going on a tour, uh, and I'm very excited about it. We we, we think carefully about these tours. They're they're expensive. They cost a lot of money. And so uh, when we do them, we really want to make sure that people get everything out of it, that you really get, you know, that, that it's worth it for you to, to go to the time and the trouble, the expense to do it. And so we're always looking for feedback from people. We ask them, well, what did you like best about the trip? What, what was most meaningful? And on several of the trips we've taken, among many, certainly not all, but among many of the people, they've said, this moment on the Mount of Beatitudes, that was one of the most meaningful things on the entire trip, because this is what we do. We go to this place on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee where the landscape goes up in a hill pretty dramatically right there. And we go up by a place called the Church of the Beatitudes. Now the Church of the Beatitudes is a beautiful church, Italian design, it's very interesting looked at, but we don't go in there. We go off to the side to the kind of place where Jesus would have sat with his disciples and actually delivered this message. We know that it was in this general location. Of course, nobody can say for sure what the exact spot was, but it was in this general location on the northern side of this sloping hill that goes up from the Sea of Galilee that Jesus sat with his disciples. And what we do is we go there, and I tell people, you got some time on your own. Read the Sermon on the Mount. And people just sit there, they'll find a rock or a place to sit on and they'll open up their Bibles and they'll just start reading Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. And after letting do that for a while, before we start worship, and this is one of the parts I love the most of the tours, I I stand up and I get my Bible and I I get a little, you know, I feel like I'm Jesus right there. And and I, I say it nice and loud and I just start reading like the first half of Matthew chapter five. And there's just something very special about it. You're right there at that place. You're right there hearing those words. And you realize 
that there's something so special about this message that Jesus delivered to his people on that sloping hill that rises up from the Sea of Galilee that it's worth us paying attention to. Now, Matthew chapter five, verse one, it says that Jesus did this in response to seeing the multitude. In the previous section in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter four, verse 25, it says that great multitudes were following Jesus. The the, the crowds were getting bigger and bigger. There was a greater and greater press. And I wonder if Jesus didn't look at those multitudes following him and wonder, do they really know what it means to follow me? You know, Jesus was not interested in gathering a bunch of superficial followers. He wanted people that understood what he was all about and he wanted people who would be committed to him and to the kingdom he was establishing. So not wanting superficial followers, Jesus seeing the great multitude, he went up on this hillside, but please notice something. We shouldn't think that he went up on the mountain or the hillside to remove himself from the multitudes. Now, it's true that the Bible says that Jesus gave this teaching to his disciples, but please understand this. It doesn't mean the 12. Sometimes disciples is used in the New Testament in a limited sense, referring just to the 12, but other times it's used in a general sense of those who were the followers of Jesus or even the potential followers of Jesus. So you shouldn't think of this being a small group. This is not 12 men gathered around Jesus listening to him. There are probably hundreds present listening to Jesus explain what the kingdom of God was all about. Matter of fact, at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says that the people, the people in general were astonished. Let's take a look at that. Matthew chapter seven, verses 28 and 29 says, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The people, again, not just the 12, but the people, this was a broadly given message for those who were the followers and the potential followers of Jesus Christ. It's as if he's telling them, let me explain to you what being my follower is really all about. Matter of fact, Luke tells us that this same basic material was given on a different occasion and that it was spoken, again I'm quoting now from Luke chapter 6, to a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and were healed of his diseases. You see, Jesus explains here, this is a message for disciples, but disciples in the broader sense, not in the narrow sense. Here's the message. This wasn't a secret message. Jesus isn't saying, okay, you want to be my followers? Come away into the cave, and I'll give you the information that nobody knows. Ladies and gentlemen, the message of Jesus of Nazareth was not like that. He proclaimed it. He wanted everybody to know. Everybody should know, this is what my kingdom's all about. You want to be my follower? This is what it's about. And so what did he do? He took a seat. That's what it says in verse 1. When he was seated. Now, by the way, in the ancient world, in the Jewish world of Jesus' day, that was the common posture for a teacher. In those days, the teacher sat and his listeners stood. What a pretty pass we've come to in the last 2,000 years. I don't know how we ever got to such an unbiblical Christianity. No, no, I'm just only joking. You know, because the Bible doesn't command that the teachers sit and the people stand. That was just their custom in those days. But that's what it means. When Jesus sat down, it means he got ready to teach. And there's something special about this teaching. I'll tell you what's special about it. When I look at my Bible, um, the publishers of the Bible that I have in front of me, I look at Matthew chapters five, six, and seven, and what do I notice immediately? It's red. It's like it's bleeding all over these pages. Now, do you know what a red letter edition of the Bible is? Not every Bible is published as a red letter edition, but sometimes publishers do that. They publish them with red letters to indicate the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus are in red in a red letter edition Bible. Now, there's an error sometimes with that, and please, everybody needs to understand this. The words of Jesus, the red letters, 
are not any more inspired by God than the words of Paul or John or Isaiah or Jeremiah. This Bible in its entirety is equally inspired by God. So we're not saying that the red letters are any more inspired, but I will tell you, I think there is something, at least a little aspect that's special about the red letters, and it's simply this. We know that when we read a letter from Paul, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, it is God's breathed out word. We understand that, and it's through the personality of Paul. You can read, go, that's Paul. We understand that when we read John in his letters, you read it out, it's the inspired word of God breathed out from him, but it's through the personality of John. You read the letters, you go, that's John. There's something wonderful about the teaching of Jesus because not only is it the inspired words of Jesus, it's through the very personality of Jesus. And that just say, well, it's not any more inspired But man, that catches my attention. I want to pay attention to that. So Jesus sat down and he was about to give this long extended discourse. The disciples came to him, it says there in verse one and now verse two, it says, then he opened his mouth and taught them saying, I'm not gonna get into what he taught them. That starts next week. That's really the good part. What he actually, this is introduction. You know, if you were going to miss two sun, if you were going to miss a Sunday, this was the Sunday to miss. <laughs> you got to come next Sunday because that's the. And then we're really getting into what he taught. I'm sorry, we didn't tell you this was the one that you should. So be here next Sunday when we talk about the Beatitudes, this beginning part. But please understand that that, that there's an introduction that says that he opened his mouth to speak. Now, you, of course. He's not a ventriloquist, you know, speaking through a closed mouth. No, but I want you to think about a couple things. Number one, I want you to think about how many times Jesus taught his disciples and never said a word. Every person he healed, that was an example for his disciples, wasn't it? Every person he loved on, every sinner he forgave, every gesture of love. Think about all the times that the disciples learned something from Jesus just by watching him in action. He taught them many times without ever opening his mouth. But of course, he also taught them by what he said. But there's also something else here for us to consider. That phrase, he opened his mouth and taught them, it's a figure of speech that was used in those days to refer now is a time when somebody is going to say something important and weighty. He's speaking to a large crowd of people and he's speaking as if it is important. By the way, just as an aside, sometimes when I'm discussing with other pastors or preachers and I'm giving some some of my thoughts on what's important as a pastor or a preacher, I I often tell them, you you should speak it as if it's what you're saying is important. You you know, come on, pastor, if what you're saying is important, speak as if it is. Don't speak as if you're half falling asleep up there. And, And if what you're saying isn't important, then maybe you should get off the platform and let somebody who does have something important to say get up there and say. So Jesus is speaking to the multitude as it's important, and it says there in verse two, and he taught them saying, and what follows is a message that has long been recognized as the sum of Jesus's, or for that matter, of anybody else's greatest teaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us how to live, and he tells us what life should be like in his kingdom. It has been said, and I think rightfully so, that if you take all the good advice on how to live that's ever been uttered by any philosopher or or psychiatrist or counselor, and if you took out all the foolishness and boiled it down to its real essentials, you would be left with a very poor imitation of the Sermon on the Mount. And by the way, the Sermon on the Mount for all its weight, for all its strength, if I could even say for all of its glory, it takes you less than 15 minutes to read it out loud. Try it at home. Just sit down, Matthew chapters five, six, and seven, it'll take you less than 15 minutes to read it out loud. Now, I believe that this address, as Jesus originally gave it, was longer. It's in the custom of biblical authors to give us an accurate condensation of what they actually wrote and said. 
But again, what we have recorded for us takes less than 15 minutes to read. And oh, is it important. You see, the Sermon on the Mount is sometimes thought of as Jesus' declaration of the kingdom. In the founding of the United States of America, the American revolutionaries had their declaration of independence. Uh, In the communist world, they, they, they had this seminal work, the Communist Manifesto. It's as if the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' manifesto. This is the manifesto of my kingdom. This is the declaration of what my kingdom is all about so that everybody can know. At the same time, I agree with what the Bible commentator John Stott said about the Sermon on the Mount. He said that the Sermon on the Mount is the part of Jesus' teaching that is best known, least understood, and least obeyed. It's probably true because it presents a radically different agenda than what the nation of Israel expected from the Messiah. You see, the Sermon on the Mount doesn't present the political or material blessings of the Messiah's reign, and that's mainly what they were focused upon. Instead, it expresses to us the spiritual implications of what it means when Jesus Christ is the king of your life. This great message tells us what it means when your life is lived with Jesus as Lord and King. It's important to understand that the Sermon on the Mount does not, strictly speaking, oh, we're going to understand it much better in the next 20 weeks, but strictly speaking, the Sermon on the Mount doesn't really give us a plan of salvation. The Sermon on the Mount does not really explain to us, all right, look, You're a sinner in need of a savior. You need to trust to the atoning work of Jesus on the cross because Jesus on the cross died for our sins and he bore in himself all the penalty and guilt and shame that our sin deserved. He bore it in himself perfectly on the cross. And now when we put our faith in him, when we uh, repent and put our faith in Jesus, then we can be cleansed from our sin and we can have a security in this life and in the next. The the Sermon on the Mount doesn't really explain it, except for the first part. If you understand the Sermon on the Mount correctly, you will come face to face with the fact that you are a sinner. Because we're gonna read a lot. We're gonna read about things like um, the way we should pray, the way we should fast, the way we should give. We're we're gonna read about the kind of commitment that God calls us to in the Christian life. We're gonna be talking about how we should forgive one another, all these different things. And repeatedly, we're gonna come back to the place, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. Friends, if we work our way through the Sermon on the Mount, and if the general reaction from all of us is, yeah, I do that, I do that, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, then I don't think we've understood it very well. One of the real functions of understanding the Sermon on the Mount is to show us that we need a Savior and continually we can point ourselves to what Jesus did for us on the cross and at the empty tomb to be our rescue. Again, the Bible tells us that the Sermon on the Mount is not so much telling us how to get to heaven as it tells us what life should be like for those who are on their way to heaven. And that's what it was when Jesus taught them. Now, there's something else that I want to explain to you about the Sermon on the Mount and something that I can't prove. I try to be very careful to you what I think is clear biblically and what might only be implied biblically. So I don't think I can prove this, but nevertheless, I believe it. To me, the evidence is convincing enough for me to offer this before you, even with that little disclaimer. In my opinion... The Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' standard sermon. It was the core of his itinerant message. It was a simple proclamation of how God expects us to live, contrasting with the common Jewish misunderstanding of that life in that day. And I believe that pretty much whenever Jesus went and spoke to a new audience, he gave them this message. Oh, have I never spoke to you before? All right, well, let's start at the beginning. Let me tell you what, the, what life is like in my kingdom. Let me tell you what it means to have the Messiah rule among you. Let's get that straight first. Now, what, why do I believe that? Because I'm fascinated by all these passages in the New Testament that tell us that Jesus went all around the region of Galilee and preached the kingdom. 
Let me just walk you through these. And this won't take very long, but it's five or six different passages. Uh, First of all, Matthew chapter four, verse 23. It says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. What did he do? Well, yes, he healed the sick and that's a wonderful thing, but he also went around and he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, Then in Matthew chapter nine, verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Well, that's what Jesus did. Jesus went all around and what did he do? It says once again, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And then in Luke chapter 4, verse 43, it says, But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And then finally, in Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. So do you see this pattern? Jesus went repeatedly throughout the whole region of Galilee. And when he would go to a place, I think first things first, let me explain to you what the kingdom of God is like. And I think the best expression of what the kingdom is like is found in the gospel, excuse me, in the Sermon on the Mount. That's why the Gospel of Luke has a section that reads very much like the Sermon on the Mount, which to my mind seems to have been given on a different occasion, because this was a kind of teaching that Jesus often gave in different places. It defined what his kingdom was all about, and it was his way as training the disciples in the message he wanted them to carry to others. Matter of fact, notice what it says in Luke chapter 9, verse 2. He sent them, meaning the disciples, to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. You see, that's what they want. Go out and preach this message. Tell other people what my kingdom is like and what it means to be a citizen of my kingdom. I'll tell you what, it is very clear that the Sermon on the Mount had a very significant impact on the early church we know from the writings of the earliest Christians that they referenced the Sermon on the Mount a lot. It was on their minds. It was in their heart. They were radical disciples who believed and lived the Sermon on the Mount. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that if we as followers of Jesus Christ, if we will believe and live the Sermon on the Mount, we will revolutionize our community. We simply will. Now, part of it is difficult because there needs to be this aspect where our prior misunderstanding of the kingdom is shaken up. Matter of fact, in the different parts of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives considerable time to shaking up their misunderstandings of the kingdom. If I could break it down into four parts, I would break it down like this. First of all, broadly speaking, the Sermon on the Mount deals with the Beatitudes, and Jesus kind of describes his upside-down kingdom. That's what we're going to get into first next week. Then Jesus talks about fixing what's wrong, understanding and applying God's law. Jesus gives an extended section in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, you've heard it taught that but let me correct it. This is the right way to understand it. You've heard it taught that, but let me correct this. So much of the Sermon on the Mount is correcting misunderstandings that people have. And ladies and gentlemen, do you understand that? That sometimes the biggest obstacle for us learning is unlearning the bad stuff that we've been taught. And that's why Jesus deals with that first. Then he moves on to his next section where he talks about doing what's right, living kingdom life. And then the life of a disciple seeking after God. Those are four broad sections and we'll work our way through it with, I don't know, 20, 21 messages. We'll see how it goes. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, this aspect of the kingdom is so challenging because we set up our expectations of what the kingdom of God is like. And then we can get bitter at God for not fulfilling our expectations of it. In Jesus' day, the Jewish people wanted the kingdom of God. 
They wanted the Messiah and they were longing for the kingdom. But they lived under terrible oppression under the Romans and they felt it. It was political, it was economic, it was military. They lived under terrible oppression from the Romans. Therefore, when they wanted the kingdom, what did they primarily think of the kingdom as? The kingdom is going to be that which drives out the hated Romans. I want the kingdom. I want to drive out those people who oppress me, who take advantage of me politically and militarily and economically. Drive them out. That's the kingdom of God. And what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, love your enemies. Wow. That's the kingdom, but not the one they were looking for. If I define God's kingdom primarily in terms of my pleasure, my satisfaction, my comfort, I might need to be shaken up about what the true nature of God's kingdom is and the values of it. And you know what? Let's all get shook up together by the Sermon on the Mount. Because when Jesus taught them about a kingdom, it was something that they needed to hear and we need to hear. Because it was and it is a kingdom different than what most people expect. It was and it is a kingdom that's different from anything else on this earth. It was and it is a kingdom that is both right now and yet it is also to come. And then it was and it is a kingdom that is real wherever Jesus rules. One of the things I want to emphasize throughout this series is that the kingdom of God and the life that Jesus exemplified by the Sermon on the Mount, it is real. It's not a fantasy land or that maybe only a few achieve but God helping us, we will live as kingdom citizens in the here and now, and as I said before, make a tremendous impact on our community. Now, let me leave us with just a couple of thoughts here. Uh, and this is still going to take a little while, so set your watch for maybe another five or ten minutes on this one. The first thing is this. It is so on my heart that we do not teach through the Sermon on the Mount as if we had a whip upon your backs. See this? You don't do it. Start doing it. You see this? You don't do it. Start doing it. Because the Sermon on the Mount can really do that to us, can't it? This is one thing I want you to understand. Yes, I believe that it's God's will and God's call on my life and on yours for us to actually live out what it says in the Sermon on the Mount. Nobody in here is going to do it perfect. Only Jesus did it perfect. But we should endeavor with all our heart, Lord, I want to live this kind of life, but please understand this. You can never live this kind of life without the active empowering of the Holy Spirit in you. This is not something you do for God. This is something you do God living it out in you. And there has to be the active, living, flowing presence of the Holy Spirit in your life to accomplish that. Uh, sometimes it kind of uh, is more, you know, some times of the year and less other times of the year. But sometimes uh, I try to get a little exercise and stay in shape. So I'll go to the gym from time to time. I like my gym. It's a great place. That, that's, I think it's hopefully beneficial for me. And just in the last couple months, I've tried to resume something I was doing about a year ago. In the last couple months, I've tried to resume riding a bike. So uh, I'm a pure amateur bike rider. I, I don't even feel like I'm qualified to wear those special pants that they wear. So I, that's not for me. I'm not up to that level yet. So it'd be good for me to lose a few more pounds before I tried that too. So, you know, I'm purely an amateur, but I get on my bike and I wear a helmet and, and, and I try to, you know, get in a ride for exercise. And, and I got something really embarrassing to tell you about that. Um, I, I've been, you know, I put in, I don't know, six, seven rides in the last three weeks or so, trying to get in a couple rides a week. And I was going out for a ride yesterday morning. 
But before I did it, I, I went, before I went over, I did something that was a breakthrough in my bike riding. Listen, I, I rode faster. I, I did an average of more than two miles an hour faster on that ride yesterday than I had done in the previous three weeks. And, and it was so much easier, and, and I'm embarrassed to tell you what the breakthrough was. But I will. Here's the breakthrough. I put more air in my tires. <laughs> now, you would think that'd be pretty elementary, but this is what an amateur rider I am. Now, it's not, not like there was no air in the tires. Please, I'm not that dumb. It's not like, they were, it's not like there was no air. But I, I just thought before yesterday's ride, why don't I check? Why don't I check the air in the tires? So I went and I checked, I go, man, that's like less than half of what it's supposed to be. Now, the bike was still rideable, no doubt about it. I may have been riding at miles the, the previous three weeks. But I said, well, why don't I pump it up to what it's supposed to be? So, you know, you look on the cell, okay, this is how much, so I pumped it up to what it's supposed to be, and man, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I mean, I thought, before I thought, it's just because I'm so out of shape, and I still am out of shape, but I, it was encouraging. Look, more air in the tires made a huge difference. I was doing the same thing as before, but what a difference having the right amount of air in the tires. And it reminded me immediately that both in the Hebrew language and in the ancient Greek language, the word for air is the same word for spirit. In ancient Greek, it's pneuma. And I said, Lord, spiritually, I need more air in my tires. I, I can be doing the same thing, but, but it doesn't go as smooth, it doesn't go as right, it, just, it doesn't work the way it should if I'm, so to speak, and you'll, you'll forgive the, the kind of silly illustration, but if I'm low on air in my church, if, if I don't have a fullness of the Spirit of God flowing in my life, it just doesn't work the way that it should. So I plead with you as your pastor, as we make our way through the Sermon on the Mount, would you please continually, starting with this morning, make yourself open to the filling and the flow and the operation of the Holy Spirit of God. We're not looking for something that we do apart from God and then present to him as if it's a gift. We say, no, God, if this life represented by the Sermon on the Mount is going to be lived, it's going to be lived as you work in and through your people. I open myself up to the flow and to the filling of your spirit because I need it so badly. We need that collectively. When we have our prayer team up a little bit later this morning, you may very well want to come up and just say, brother, sister, could you please pray for me that I would be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't get quite everything Pastor David said, but I, I need more air in my tires. He could just say that. And we, we'd love to pray for you for that. And then the last thing. If we are presenting Jesus as king and this is the message of his kingdom. I, I wonder if there's not some people here this morning, you want to come into his kingdom. You want to declare yourself and declare your allegiance to Jesus as your king. And look, you, you look like wonderful people. You've been so kind to pay attention the last half hour or so. But, but listen, I, I don't know all of your stories. And there may very well be people here this morning, you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You haven't come to him in those terms of unconditional surrender and say, Jesus, you're my king. Oh, listen, it, we love that Jesus is our friend. We love that he's our brother. We, we love that he's our shepherd. But let me tell you what else he is. He's your king. And, and you're never going to be rightly related to Jesus Christ unless you come to him in those terms. You are my king and I am your subject. I surrender my life to you. I owe everything I am to you. I surrender unto you, Jesus as king. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, uh, Joseph, our worship leader, is going to come out with the worship team and, and get ready to lead us in a song. During that song, I'm going to give an invitation. If there be a single person here who recognizes, no, this is my morning to declare I want to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. I want to recognize him as my king. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. So I'm going to pray, and Christians all around, I want you to pray when we give this invitation that maybe if there's even one among us, that that person would say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be my king. Father, as we begin this series on the Sermon on the Mount, we ask that you would move within us. Lord, I, I, 
I, I look at the power of Jesus and his teaching in this section. And I'm a bit overwhelmed by it, but Lord, I know. I know that hearts can be hard and cold and fallow ground needs to be broken up to the glory of Jesus. We, we don't want to come and, and hear sermons and have it bounce off ground that's not plowed. So Lord, right now, we surrender our hearts to Jesus and we say, Jesus, do whatever cultivation work needs to happen in our heart so that your word, both this morning and over the next few months, that Father, your word would bear great, great fruit in our lives. Jesus, we thank you that you are our king. We pray that you'd help us to wipe away every misunderstanding we might have had about your kingdom and what it means for our life and that you would lead us, Lord God, into this place of understanding and receiving the power and the goodness of your kingdom. Prepare us for it, Lord. Do a great work in and through this congregation, through your magnificent Sermon on the Mount. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.